Uh, hi all, welcome back to uh, track two. Uh, next talk is uh, attacking XML processing from uh, Nicolai Gagua. Please welcome him. Hi all. Uh, so I'm Nicolai Gagua and I will talk about uh, attacking XML processing. A short introduction about myself. I have been working in information security for more than 12 years. And 18 months ago, a customer asked me to audit several um, applications using XML digital signatures. And I compromised uh, three targets. There was one client side and two server side. And during this engagement, I found this kind of technology fun. And I chose to investigate more. And now I have a very big bunch of uh, XML-related vulnerabilities. You have a uh, client side, WebKit, Adobe Reader, Firefox, server side with uh, LifeRay or .NET Nuke, and some libraries which are used a lot. And that's what I will speak about. I will first uh, introduce uh, XML technologies. Then I will speak about encapsulation, which is the fact of hiding some interesting data inside XML containers. Then I will present uh, limited denial of service attacks, which are useful in black box mode in order to detect if a specific kind of processing occurs. And the main technical part, which is the exploitation of both XXC and XSLT vulnerabilities. So XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. We will try to define the three terms. Markup, it's a easier one. It's like HTML, everything is between angle brackets, and you have some tags, uh, you have some attributes, so here too, so it's very simple. Extensibility is very important, and in order to understand extensibility, we need to understand namespaces. Uh, namespaces are used to define the precise meaning of a tag, and they are usually defined by a URL. So that's a very simple example. We have a HTML document with two namespaces. This is the default, default one, which is the XHTML namespace, and the full one, which is a private namespace, uh, with uh, my own uh, URL. And then when a browser will try to interpret this document, only the word word will be underscored because the browser have no idea of the meaning of the U tag in this namespace. Okay? <clears throat> so the main use of namespaces is to avoid ambiguities. For example, if you find a font tag, you need to know if it's related to XHTML, to SVG, or to a very specific uh, Oracle configuration file. <clears throat> but there is some more interesting stuff for attackers. You can use some namespaces in order to trigger some very specific features. For example, the first one can be used to call PHP code from XSLT. It could be useful. The second one can be used to create file uh, in the libxslt parser, which is used, for example, in WebKit. So I published last year a vulnerability when you can create file on the client hard drive. And the third one is used in ZLNJ to execute Java code from XSLT. The next term is language. In fact, in uh, XML, in a valid XML document, you can find much more than only data. So we have data. You can have uh, XSLT code inside the XML document. It's still valid XML. You can find some grammar in the doc document type definition, and processing instruction, which will instruct the parser to trigger a specific uh, XSLT code, for example, to, in order to 
apply it to a XML document. The main point is we need to be careful that we, we, are, we can have much more than data when processing XML document. So that's uh, an example of a complex XML document. On the first line, you, on the first line, you have a processing instruction. On the second line, you have a DTD. Then you have some XML data. Then some XSLT code. And the overall goal of this document is to generate some SVG output. You can see the namespaces here. Um, the question is, is it really useful to create this kind of document? The, the answer is yes. This document is several interesting things. It's first some XML data with embedded XSLT code. It's also a self-contained dynamic SVG image. And it's a poke for the WebKit vulnerability dropping file on the victim's hard drive. And if we, if we open this document in several browsers, in Firefox, Transformix is the internal name of the XSLT engine. You have a green circle. It seems OK. Uh, in Opera, you get the same result. And in Chrome, Chromium, and Safari, and Maxton, you will get a red circle. And you need to check your TMP directory for a file just dropped. XML is used in a lot of uh, technologies. So I already spoke about SVG and XSLT. If you are reading some blogs, you are probably using RSS or AtomFit. Uh, office documents are mostly XML. Web service use a lot of XML technologies, for example, SOAP or XML RPC. And you can even listen music using some uh, X XSPF uh, playlists, which are supported by VLC. So there is uh, some XML documents everywhere. And I have some real-life screenshots of application using XML. So that's the Microsoft Link um, online service. And as, as a user, you can uh, provide an XML file, which will be passed by the application. So you can uh, trigger some specific processing server side. The W3C offers this kind of functionality, which is the XSLT engine available online. You can provide your own URL to XSLT and XML. So it's very dangerous. I didn't check, but you can probably execute uh, Java code server side using this kind of interface. Uh, Chronopost is a French uh, shipping service. And if you are using the professional version of the interface, you have some link. OK. You have some link uh, like this. And the fun part is that this kind of servlet and these parameters are exactly the same in the sample application provided with, with Xalang so it could be that Chronopost is using in production over the internet the sample uh, XalanJ application, which is uh, very vulnerable to a lot of things. I didn't play with it, but you could try. And that's some Google result uh, looking for in URL, EX, XSL URL uh, equal HTTP. The fun part is that you have a lot of technologies. You have ASPX. Uh, you have some XQuery. You have some Java servlets. And here you have some PHP code. So it's really cross-platform. Everybody is using XSLT. Um, even if you are using PHP or ASPX, everything is uh, possible in XML. When auditing some application using XML, we need uh, to ask ourselves a few questions. 
the first question is how can we fit some XML document to the application? It's always the same problem in auditing. And if you find a way to submit data, for example, a file upload or a REST interface or anything else, you need to ask, is the data processed by the application? So I have a, a nice example. If you upload the SVG file to Wikimedia, uh, for example, Wikipedia, there is an automatic conversion to PNG, which occurs. So it can be difficult to detect. You just can upload some SVG file, but you need to know that there is some processing done server side autom automatically. Uh, so if there's some processing, you need to find who is doing the processing and where. It's mostly client side and server side. In some B2B environments, you can find some gateways which are doing on-the-fly transformations in order to support several versions of the same protocol, for example. And a very basic example is uh, Atom or RSS feeds, which can be read client-side in your browser or in a dedicated software, or server-side, for example, in your Google home page. And then, once you know where are the processing points, you need to ask some questions about their functionalities. So if you can submit some arbitrary data, are processing instructions um, executed by the application? If you can submit some grammar, are external entity resolved? If yes, you probably have a XML external entity vulnerability. And if you can provide some XSLT code, which extensions are available, you can have something like uh, accessing databases or executing Java code. Um, all the demonstrations during the talk are based on Atom Fit. So it's a very, uh, it's false, but it's a, uh, a simplistic view of Atom feed. You have a root tag, which is feed, the block title, and for each entry, you have another uh, title. The demo infrastructure is um, simple. We have three server-side applications, one using uh, Perl under Linux uh, and a dedicated library, and one using PHP under Linux, and the formatting is done with XSLT and one under Windows using J, JSP and XSLT. And the Atom content is provided by some uncontrolled server on the internet. And here is the attacker. Um, So that's a local copy of the Atom feed from the US cert, as you can see here. And if we submit to the Perl application, we have a very simple display. For each entry, we have the size of the entry and its name. And we have exactly the same layout on PHP. and in Java. OK. So everybody is now OK with XML. We will speak about encapsulation. Um, XDP is a file format defined by Adobe. It's a very old file format. And this is a screenshot of its Wikipedia page. The interesting point is that um, this format can uh, be used as a container for PDF and XFA uh, data. And it, it can also be used uh, inside a PDF document. So it's easy to see. We can play Russian dots. Uh, XDP with inside a PDF file, inside the XDP file, inside the PDF, and we will try to find some interesting use. 
like uh, bypassing INT values. Um, so it's um, the MSF cool type uh, dot PDF file is uh, generated by Metasploit. It's very basic. It's a three year old vulnerability. And excuse me, it's detected uh, here eight out, out of nine and here 27 out of 43 antivirus think it's infected. And we'll try to avoid at least some antivirus. Uh, that's the patch for Metasploit. Uh, it's uh, something like uh, 10 lines long, and it's very simple. You take your PDF, you do some base 64 encoding, and you put the result here, and you get a XDP file. And if we submit this XDP file to antivirus, we get zero out of nine, and zero out of 43 antivirus solution. So we have a full uh, some percent uh, detection uh, evasion. The fun part is that XDP files are automatically, automatically opened by Adobe under Windows. It's a very similar icon. So if you, can, uh, if you send an email with a XDP attachment and the user double click on the attachment, you get your malicious PDF open inside Adobe. So now we will try to create some limited resource starvation in order to detect some kind of processing in black box mode. So if we go back to the um, SVG to PNG conversion by Wikimedia, we may wonder, is uh, DTD processed? And so we will use the billion love attack, which is very well known. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, you define your DTD. Uh, you define a lol variable, its value is lol, and the lol1 variable, its value is 10 times the lol variable, etc., 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 and in your document, you insert the lol9 variable. So you have um, something like uh, in-memory um, extension of the variable. And if we do some quick math, we will get uh, one billion of lol string, which is three gigabyte, which could be enough to slow down the server and detect that the DTD is effectively processed by the Wikimedia application. For now we want to detect if some XML digital signature application is supporting XSLT. The norm say it should, it should, and the best practice by the W3C say it shouldn't. So we are something similar. You have the XSL number function, which will convert uh, one number to in another format. We will try to convert uh, uh, 1337, and the I format is for Roman uh, numerals. So we get this kind of output. And the interesting thing is that the M is the biggest unit in Roman numerals. So if we ask for bigger values, we will get a lot of M. So we are requesting some very large number here. And we will get one gigabyte of M. So it's uh, similar to the previous trick, but you are here detecting XSLT processing and not DTD processing. So I have a few demonstrations. Mm, okay. So that's the billion love attacks. I just uh, use uh, LOL6 in order not to crash my computer. So if I submit to the Perl application, it works. I get a four megabyte string. In PHP, you have a kind of error message because, excuse me, error. There is a 
entity reference loop which is detected. I didn't have a look to the code. It probably can bypass its PHP. <laughs> it's easy, excuse me. Um, and in JSP, we will get an error because we can, oh no. So it works, it's another demo. Uh, it works in JSP2. And here it's uh, XSL number uh, proof of concept. So the per application is not using SSLT, so no point in testing. The PHP one, it works. I don't know if you see the scroll bar, it's very small. And if we submit to JSP, we get an error because it can convert values which are greater than uh, four thousands. I don't know why, it's probably in order to avoid this kind of vulnerabilities, but there is no documentation related to this, to this bug or feature, it depends. Okay, and the last thing. If I try to open the feed directly in Firefox, it will detect some, it's some atom, and will propose some to subscribe to the feed. And as you can see, we have the extension which occurs. So it's very funny. Lol. Okay. Now, uh, I will now speak about XML external entities, which is probably the most common XML vulnerability. It's very simple. You define a doc type and uh, an entity, which is here ref, and its value is the content of the etc password file. So each time you will uh, use this uh, value in your document, it will be replaced by the content of the etc password file. That some XXC vulnerabilities published or found since uh, last summer. In bold, it's uh, vulnerabilities I found myself, and in red, it's vulnerabilities in some libraries. So, for example, RESTLET uh, was patched this week, and there is uh, something like uh, 10 or 20 applications uh, using this library, so they are all impacted. And it's enough to speak uh, REST with the application to steal every file you want, including configuration files. In my opinion, the impact is mostly underestimated. <clears throat> That's uh, what is well known about uh, XXC attacks. You can read some ASCII file, text file, or UTF-8. Uh, you can eat the internal network. Uh, I mean, you can see the network as seen from the parser. And you can, for example, uh, do some banner grabbing or do some blind eat in order to exploit Tomcat internal servers, for example. You have some specific tricks in Windows environments. You can use uh, the file handler in order to do some path, G, path the hash or stealing NTLM hashes. And under Java, you can list the content of directories, which is very useful if you don't know the setup of the target. And there's then we have some advanced uh, features. You can read a binary file. It's uh, in PHP. You can uh, access some LDAP internal servers using Perl. And you can execute some arbitrary command in PHP and much more. Everything depends on the context of execution. It depends of, on the XML parser itself. Um, the operating system, as 
we just see under Windows you have some specific tricks. The programming language, because most uh, Xala XSLT parser allow to execute Java code. And the application features, which could add, add some additional uh, URL handler. So that's the file URL handler. Under Unix, you can uh, access pseudo file system like proc, which could be useful for exploit exploitation of uh, memory corruption bug later in the process. Uh, the path the hash under Windows and directory listing under Java. PHP. Uh, there is a lot of um, sp special uh, URL handler in PHP. The HTTP one is very friendly because if you can get some error message, you can uh, rec uh, get the banner. So it's uh, SSH, it's uh, VNC. Uh, there is a PHP URL handler which can be used to do some pre-processing on open file. Uh, this means that uh, you open uh, this kind of URL and each time you call read on the file descriptor, you will get by 64 encoded uh, result. So um, this file in PROC uh, will contain some null byte every time. And using this trick, you can uh, get the by 64 version and decode it uh, later. And you can also use uh, SSH2 to access the local machine or some internal uh, other machine. You only need to find a weak uh, username and password. So I'm using Oracle. Why? I don't know. And you can use this trick to read file on other machine. And I have a demo using the local root account. So here it's very simple. We refer the self maps uh, file in the proc uh, pseudo file system. So under PHP, as we can see, we are in a Apache 2, Apache 2 uh, process. And you get some nice information about the stack and the heap addresses. And every module uh, loaded. If we do the same thing in a Perl uh, CGI application, we get everything related to Perl, including app and uh, heap and stack address. And of course, it, it works uh, just as well with the uh, etc password. So this, uh, that's for Linux. If you want to play with window, it's very simple. And it works. OK, something more interesting. Here we will, we will use the PHP handler twice. One for do some ROT13 uh, conversion, and one for base64 encoding. And we'll read to, to specific file, as you can see here. So it works only on PHP. So that's your LSB release file, no problem. And here we get the command line of the current process. So we have uh, Apache 2, then a null byte, then a minus k, then a null byte, then start. So it's totally impossible to read this kind of file without using the PHP trick because it's not an ASCII file. Now we will connect to the SSH port on the local machine, and we get everything you need. So I'm using Ubuntu.
And here, the local root account has a weak password. And I will try to read the etc shadow file. But it's a little longer because we need to do an additional SSH connection. And here my root password. You can take pictures. <laughs> okay. And just to show the directory listing under Java, I will request the program file folder under window. Question? Okay, let's go. So, I will now speak about XSLT. XSLT is, uh, um, I have an introduction slide, yes. Uh, XSLT is a functional programming language, which is uh, the functional word is part of the problem. Uh, we will see later. And it's uh, defined by the W3C since uh, a lot of years. And it's still misunderstood, it, it seems. So the purpose of this language is to transform XML document to something, which could be XML for data extraction, which could be SVG uh, image. You can produce a chart from XML data, or PDF, TXT, whatever. It's Turing complete. Uh, there is some proof available online. So we know you can, we can play a lot of tricks. And its main use are extracting data, uh, either to display it to human people or to feed it to another application. And for example, under OpenOffice and probably Microsoft Office, when you convert uh, one Office document to another format, XLT is used behind the scene to do the conversion. And where can you find some XSLT parser? Uh, so your word processor is using XSLT, your browser is using XSLT, your database server is using XSLT. For example, in Oracle, it's very easy to trigger the XSLT parser. And in XML digital signatures, you may find some XSLT support. It depends on the implementation. That's a list of XSLT engines I played with. In blue, oh, in green, it's uh, parsers where I didn't find any vulnerability. In blue one, it's parsers which are safe by default, but you can easily change a configuration option to get, to get uh, some uh, vulnerable state. And in red, it's vulnerable XLT parsers. Uh, vulnerable, it could be to design issues or memory corruption or anything else. So that's the introduction to XSLT. Uh, the fuzzing part, I have done some very stupid fuzzing on XSLT. I mean stupid, um, it's mutation-based fuzzing. It's very simple. You take a lot of uh, XSLT engines. You take a lot of input files that you will find on Google or in bug trackers or in conformance uh, verification software. And you use a diversifier, which is a tool which will uh, take an input file and produce several output files with a small modification and you do some kind of monitoring looking for bugs. The diversifier I use is Radamsa, which is very, very, very cool. And so um, I generally give it uh, 5K files and ask for 1 billion in output, and I feed, the, I feed them to the parser. The monitoring was done uh, with Valgrin if I don't have access to the source code, for example, for the Oracle XSLT engine, and done with uh, address sanitizer, which is a LLVM plugin, 
when I can recompile the parcel. As for any fusing session, the only interesting thing is how much bug you found. So I found a lot. Uh, this is, um, I have very few published advisories because uh, vendors are slow. Uh, this is Mozilla. And the uh, interesting thing about this bug outside of the free t-shirt is the uh, bug itself. In fact, I took a SVG image. I only replaced the SVG namespace by the XSLT1. And it caused a very um, specific uh, code pass in Firefox. Nobody was able to understand what happened. And we don't know if it's exploitable or not. Um, Mozilla chose to play safe and say it's, it's exploitable. Um, but the modification, it's like uh, copy-pasting uh, 20 characters and you trigger a crash in Firefox. OK, this one is interesting. Um, so on the lower part, as you can see, uh, this is uh, Oracle error code for uh, segmentation fault. And as you, ca as you can see in the log, the frame pointer is uh, controlled by the attacker. So we have a very basic stack overflow. And for everybody interested, that's the way to access the XML and XSLT parser in Oracle. Uh, this means that if you have a SQL injection on an Oracle database, you can uh, very easily trigger this kind of, of overflow and get a shell on the database server. This is Adobe Reader 9 under Linux. It's, uh, it seems it's only a crash. But it occurs during the uh, malloc consolidate, so it's uh, heap corruption. And it's not a very nice bug. That's why I, I am able to give some information before release of the patch. But I have some other bugs working very well on Adobe Reader 10 under Windows, which is the latest version. Uh, but no patch. So there is much more. There is some WebKit, Oracle, Opera, really a lot of bugs. OK. So now we speak about uh, basic constructs. The problem with XCT is that it's a functional language. This means that uh, by construction, you will not be able to create state and you will not be able to have um, um, writable variables. So uh, from an exploitation point of view, it's a big problem because we can't create a loop. We can't create neither uh, for a while. And every variable is read-only. But we have some very specific uh, objective. We want to do some brute force. So we want to have a for loop. And we want to execute commands and get the output. So we need a while loop. So brute force. It's quite simple. We will put our data uh, for the while, for the for loop in XML. And we will use XSL for each for the processing. That's an, ex um, an example from the WebKit vulnerability dropping file on the local drive. In blue, it's the content of the file I want to drop. And in green, it's some possible pass. And I, will try, I want to try every possible pass. So we get this kind of loop. Uh, you need to see the root tag is data, and then location. So we got the root tag. And for each location, we get the value, and we try to create a file in this location with this content. So we effectively have a for loop. 
If you have some SQL extensions in your XSLT parser, you can use this kind of for loop in order to brute force credentials for internal database. And once you find a valid credentials, you can use the XSLT extension to grab data. And I have a code uh, uh, brute force um, password cracker. Uh, it should be available online on the wiki. The while loop is much more complicated, so we want to read STD out. The solution is to use some template, recursivity, and a code generator. Um, the code generator was created by a German guy, and it will introduce uh, three uh, new tags, which are loop updates that you can use to have some uh, writable variable and the loop for and loop while construct. Just to show the complexity, that's a four line of Java who reads a line, append it to result, and at the end will print the result. It's four line. If we use the XSLT loop compiler, it's 18 lines. So we can see our read line here. Um, and at the end, we will try to print, well, here we will try to print the result. Uh, but this is uh, invalid accessibility code because you have uh, this kind of tags which are forbidden. So you use the code generator and you get this kind of valid accessibility code which is 50 lines long, but uh, which will work as um, XCLT loop. Uh, okay, this one. Uh, so for the loop demonstration, we have a very large list of Java property, and we want to get their value. And we get a for loop here. For each property, uh, we get uh, its, value, uh, its name, its value, and we display everything. And it works very well. And as you can see, I'm using XP, SP3 on a French computer, blah, blah, blah. And it's Java 170. For the while loop, we have a XML document with a list of commands we want to execute. You can see the scroll bar here. We have a very long XSLT document, which only, uh, in fact, you have some, thing, excuse me, some fingerprinting of the underlying operating system in order to choose bet between bash and cmd.exe, and then it executes the command. So it works, as you can see, there we get the Microsoft version. We get a directory listing for the C drive. And then the output of the set command. OK. Next, last part. There is a um, several way to gain um, uh, execution of high-level code in XSLT parser, mainly PHP, .NET, and Java. 
for example, in Xalangi, by default, you can execute Java code if you can execute XSLT code. In PHP, you can execute PHP code if the register PHP function is called. And in XML Spy, which is a client-side software which used for generating or uh, creating XML file, you can, by default, execute .NET or Java code. So in PHP, it's uh, very simple. Uh, we will use uh, this namespace that I show at the beginning. Uh, we will associate it to the foo keyword. And then in your XLT document, you need to call a foo function and then the PHP function and its arguments. So for example, calling PHP info, it's just a foo function PHP info. The bad news is that uh, require, include, and include once, and eval uh, can be called uh, using this kind of stuff. I don't know why. It seems it's a um, PHP specificity. Uh, it's, mm, it's not functions. But uh, we can use assert and uh, pill-reg replace, which are well known to allow PHP code execution. Java is more complicated. Uh, in fact, uh, at Berlin side, like last year, I said that it seemed impossible to get some, to get some Java and XSLT interactive shell because we can't create thread and we can't create our own classes. So it seems very difficult. And just after Berlin side, I published my content online and I have a German guy, which is Michi42, who told me that I was wrong, and it was possible to execute arbitrary base64 class, class files in Java. So for me, it was a very uh, big win, because it seems to be impossible for um, two or three months. Uh, I spent on um, these kind of bugs. And in fact, uh, Mihi have, have uh, published Java Payload, which is a Swiss knife or for Java exploit. And you can uh, output a lot of payload in a lot of uh, formats. For example, you can create JAR file or applet. And this is interesting to me, Xalang output. So you can choose your payload, which is a reverse shell, for example, and ask for Xalan J output, and you get an XSLT style sheet, which will trigger a reverse, a reverse shell. In order to get things uh, done easier, I code a Metasploit module, which should be perhaps in the next, ver next version, which is for .3. And for the moment, you can still uh, access the ticket. Uh, the code is available in the ticket. And it's a very easy way to get some PHP or Java interpreter share. And I have some demonstration. So that's the way to get a PHP interpreter shell in XSLT under PHP when PHP register function is called. So we will uh, call a PREG replace uh, first. Here, the namespace, which is associated to, to PHP. Here, PHP function, PREG replace. And here, our code, our PHP code, and our PHP code is here. It's very simple. We will do an eval on the um, base64 decoding of this kind of string. So the base64 string is generated automatically by Metasploit. OK. So Metasploit, it's very simple. You use uh, the exploit. Target 0 is for PHP. Target 1 is for Java. OK. Uh, that's um, 
uh, RC uh, resource, Metasploit resource, just to avoid uh, typing every command. So I have, I don't know if you see from the back, I have uh, two uh, jobs who are waiting. It's the PHP and the Java one. And if I submit to PHP, okay. Thank you. Okay. As you can see, it's a PHP Metapreter shell under Apache. Okay. The Java one is much more complicated. In fact, we will use reflection in order to access enough uh, internal uh, function of Java to create our own classes. And we will use uh, enough functionality to download uh, external jar file, which is uh, in, which include a Metasploit Metapreter, and we will just execute it. Uh, just to show you, if somebody understands this kind of uh, Java code, uh, who does? And submit to JSP. It's a little longer. Okay, test complete. And another metapreter shell, which this time is in Java. And as you can see, I get a system privilege under the Windows machine, which is game over. Okay, and the last one. That's uh, the smaller Firefox crash I have. As you can see, there is a right parenthesis missing here. And this will break the parser. And you can get something like that. Boom. Bye bye. Okay. Conclusion. XML is everywhere. You really need to wonder how your application is parsing XML and not is it parsing XML. Uh, XML is much more than data. The XML, XML external entity attack are related to the grammar. The XSLT attacks are related to code execution. It's not data and you need to check uh, very carefully if your document uh, embed more than data on how your application will pass this kind of content. Third point, the offensive side have more and more tools. Um, in penetration testing, I gain sometimes some shells on big, big, big uh, backend, like uh, processing credit cards using XSLT. Um, so it works really well in real life. And the last point, which is not a good news, is that uh, this kind of DTD and XSLT attacks are known for more than 10 years. The first publication were, were in two, 2001 uh, by Guninsky, for example, and we still find a lot of vulnerable application. If you have some questions, it's time, and thank you for coming. Thank you for a nice presentation, cool stuff. Um, basically, a qu short question, uh, where can we find or did you publish the demo like page you have been using for the presentation? Can we get the source code for that and play? Okay, um, the URL was on the last slide, which was already uh, shift. It's, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so on this uh, wiki, you will find uh, most of my uh, findings. 
uh, including uh, every source code and everything. The fun part is that uh, this uh, wiki has a REST interface for publication and it's vulnerable to uh, XXC attacks, which is still unpatched. So please do not add my own wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No? Well, then please uh, thank him. There's uh, a coffee break right now going on, and after that's going to be the last talk over here with the, off the top of my head, the ghost in the window.